Sarah Sampson. I'm the uh, therapist team coordinator with Dream Life Services. I am an LCSW and a CSAT candidate. Uh, I've been in the field for just about 10 years, working primarily with addiction and trauma. My background's working with the Ada County Veterans Treatment Court Program, and now I am the administrator for our mental health court treatment program. So happy to be here. Let's pull up these slides. Okay. All righty. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about behavioral interventions for alcohol use disorder. And down below are all my names and letters and just gave you guys all that. So we will just dive right in. Whoa, easy now. All right. So I wanted to start first with the criteria for alcohol use disorder, just to kind of refresh some memories or to educate folks who aren't familiar with it. Um, this is from the DSM-5. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first one is drinking more alcohol over a longer period of time than intended. These are the folks who say things like, you know, I meant to quit, but then, you know, my friends invited me out to brunch, so I couldn't go and just drink juice, you know, so I had some alcohol. Or these are the folks who will go on benders of weekends, weeks, however long. And when they talk about it later, they'll say something like, I don't know how that happened. I didn't mean to do that. So that's that first criteria. Criteria number two, persistent desire or unsuccessful effort to reduce alcohol use. These are the folks who will say things like, I don't know why, but I just can't seem to stop drinking, right? I really want to quit drinking, but then I always relapse and I don't know why. So these are the folks who have tried, um, you know, or maybe they really want to and haven't tried, but it just hasn't worked out for them yet. Uh, number three, great time, I'm sorry, great deal of time spent obtaining, drinking, or recovering from alcohol use. Um, these are the folks who may go to, you know, they have a different liquor store or a different gas station they go to every day of the week so that nobody knows, you know, the gas station folks don't learn their face, learn their name, and boy, you're in here a lot, you know, they'll go to different ones. Drinking, again, those benders, those day-long drinking binges. Um, and then recovering, hangovers, you know, no fun, lasting, you know, maybe a whole day, maybe they have to be hospitalized for it, and that takes up some time. So that great deal of time uh, is a big one as well. Number four is cravings, uh, kind of self-explanatory, but they feel they need to have the alcohol. It's all they can think about. It's all they can focus on. They can't think of anything else because they're just thinking about how much they want to drink or how good they're going to feel when they do drink. Uh, number five there, failure to fulfill major role obligations. So these are the folks who are calling out from work because they're hungover. Um, these are the folks who, you know, maybe get picked up on a DUI and they're in custody. So they're not able to go to work or they're not able to go to family functions. You know, these are the folks that are sick, you know, in bed for little Susie's birthday. Right. Or they have lost touch with friends. So those major role obligations in school or work, home you know, sort of out in the community things. Number six, continued use despite awareness of interpersonal or social problems. Yeah, I know they don't like it when I drink. I know my wife said she'd leave me if I kept drinking, but uh, yeah, I'm going to keep drinking. So they're aware of the problems it's causing and they're continuing to drink. Uh, number seven, giving up activities for alcohol, right? Not coaching your son's little league team or not volunteering in your daughter's classroom or whatever it might be, right? They're giving up things in order to um, drink, recover from use, right? But a lot of things in their life they are giving up because of this alcohol abuse. Using in hazardous situations, the one that comes to mind right away is uh, DUIs, right? They have been drinking. Sometimes they are still drinking when they are driving. You'll see it all the time on the arrest log, you know, in possession of open container. Um, or, you know, they are drinking on the job and maybe they work in construction and they're dealing with very sharp things or very large, heavy things and they're drunk on the job. So using in hazardous situations is a big one as well. Uh, number nine, similar to number six, continued use despite awareness of physical or psychological problems. Yeah, my docs told me that my liver is in a bad spot, but uh, yeah, I just can't quit. I know that when I'm hungover, I get really depressed and I can't leave the house for the whole day and I just feel like a piece of trash and I'm full of shame, but 
there's that continued use anyway. So they're aware of these problems and then there's the continued use on top of it. Tolerance, needing more to get the same effect, right? Well, I used to be able to get drunk off of three beers and now it takes a six pack. Well, I used to be able to get drunk off of one to two drinks and now I need a, you know, a handle of vodka to get the same effect. So it's that tolerance. And withdrawals, AKA hangovers, um, you know, feeling pretty crummy all the way up to needing to be hospitalized due to withdrawals and potential seizures and all this kind of stuff. So that's all the criteria there. Um, the individual will need to meet at least two of these criteria over a 12 month period. So if you're talking to someone and they meet two of these criteria, but it's only been for the last three months, you may be looking at a slightly different diagnosis. Uh, but if you have someone who has been a heavy drinker for 10 years and they meet maybe all of these or most of them, then it would qualify as an alcohol use disorder. And it could be mild, moderate, or severe, um, depending on the criteria that they're meeting. All right. Individual counseling is one of the uh, interventions we can use. So individual counseling can be really beneficial to process any issues that may be brought up during a group if they're also in a group setting, right? Depending on the size of the group or maybe the, the topic of the group, there may not be the time or the appropriate setting to process through any issues that may be brought up in that group. They can meet with their individual counselor and say, oh yeah, we were going over, you know, triggers and I realize that I get really triggered by this, that, and the other and kind of process it with that individual counselor. Uh, could be a good fit for those not comfortable in groups. I've had plenty of clients in the past who say things like, I don't feel comfortable in groups for one reason or another. I don't like talking in front of people. I don't know these people. Why am I going to tell all my dirty secrets in front of them if I don't know them? Um, so it could be a good fit for those not comfortable or for those whose schedule just doesn't allow, you know, maybe a two-hour group or a three-hour group. Uh, common issues discussed in individual, individual sessions, along with the addiction issues, of course, are things like trauma, um, adjustment issues and relationships, adjusting to new jobs, adjusting to divorces, loss of marriages, loss of relationships, interpersonal issues, right? You know, my wife's real mad at me because I've been drinking and she says I have to come here or she's going to leave me, right? Or, you know, my boss thinks I'm a piece of trash because I've been calling out and he knows that I'm drinking and I need to work on rebuilding that relationship. Um, and then our old friends, guilt and shame, excuse me, there's a lot of that tied into addiction, regardless of the substance that the person is addicted to. There's a lot of guilt and shame in there. Um, and that can really hold up recovery. So working through that with an individual counselor can be really helpful. Uh, each therapist out there will have a modality that they use. Um, I'm an Adlerian therapist. Uh, there are plenty others, right? Um, so a lot of individual therapists will have a modality that they tend to fall back on. That's sort of how they um, work through sessions with the client and how they you know, decide to treat people. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is a commonly used and successful modality for those that may not have a modality that they really like or feel comfortable with. Um, I'm an Adlerian, but I also will sort of pick and choose from a bunch of other things, depending on the situation, depending on the person. Uh, CBT is tried and true. Uh, we use it here uh, in a lot of our individual sessions and in a lot of our groups. Um, so it's successful, been proven successful um, and really common. Individual counseling can also do the important work of addressing the issues that led to the alcohol abuse and the alcohol use disorder. This is a really big thing. I've talked to plenty of clients who say things like, well, you know, I just want to quit drinking because of these reasons. And I say, that's excellent. I'll say, why did you start drinking? Right. And I'll say to my clients, things like, you know, nobody whose life was going fantastic. It was rainbows and puppy dogs and unicorns wakes up one day and decides to just have a really severe alcohol use problem right? There's usually some issues, some mental health, some trauma, some family issues, right? There's something that led them to drinking as, you know, a way to escape their feelings or escape the situation or escape their emotions, their thoughts, what have you. And that can really be worked on in indi individual counseling. Because I think if you don't work on the monsters and demons that got you into addiction, they are waiting for you on the other side. So when you're done with treatment or when you're done with probation or whatever it might be, they're going to be there waiting for you. And they've had really a lot of time to rally the troops. 
So you got to work on it before you get out of treatment. I think that's really super important. Uh, group counseling. Kind of talked about this on the last slide, but CBT-based groups are very effective in treating addiction, and CBT methods uh, can be found in many groups, even if they're not called CBT. Uh, these groups do well getting at the core beliefs of the clients and teaching skills to change their thinking. Uh, core beliefs, really common things. Um, one I've heard with my particular uh, population, because I work with a lot of folks who are on probation or involved in the legal system, is a, you're not the boss of me which leads to a lot of problems for them. Um, things like, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough, right? It's those core beliefs that then everything else in their life stems from them. Um, and then teaching skills to change your thinking, right? What was the antecedent? What was the trigger, right? What was the behavior? What was the consequence? Let's look at how to change the behavior, the way you react to these things or the thinking, the way you, you know, how your thinking in induces your behavior. I guess that's a good word. Um, but those can all be done in CBT groups. Very effective, really good. Uh, common groups, things like relapse prevention, you know, in whatever form it comes in, um, it can be really incredibly helpful. Groups addressing early recovery skills for those who are newly sober, think, you know, two to three months sober, you know, anything longer than that, you might be looking at more of a relapse prevention group, um, but early recovery skills, right? Identifying triggers. What are my triggers? I don't know. Well, this can, this can help you out, you know, ways to cope with those triggers, right? Well, if you're triggered by, you know, your, you know, uh, cubicle mate at work, maybe, you know, talk to with your boss about moving you to a different cubicle or, you know, maybe some deep breathing or playing the tape through. That's a really common one. Thinking about if I do this, how is it going to play out? How are those dominoes going to fall? Uh, dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, uh, is also very helpful. Um, and then trauma-specific groups. One of the screenings we do here um, that I do with my clients is the PTSD checklist for the DSM-5 or the PCL-5. Um, just to kind of, <coughs> excuse me, give me an idea of what I might be working with. Sorry, hang on. I gotta love the smoke in the air. What I might be working with in terms of a trauma history or trauma symptoms in the past month and whether trauma specific treatment could be beneficial for them. So that's, um, those can be really important as well. And group counseling can be beneficial for clients and in introducing them to a community who have been through similar things and can offer support and perspective. Not everyone who is treating, <clears throat> excuse me, substance use has a history of substance use. And you'll run across, across clients who won't listen to you, won't believe you, won't take you seriously because you haven't been there and you don't know what you're talking about. Um, when they're in these groups, they're in groups with people who have gone through similar things, maybe some of the same things, but at least similar things um, and can kind of offer a lot of that perspective, that advice, that support. Um, you know, so group counseling can be really beneficial mm -hmm. as well. Uh, medication management, want to touch on this just a little bit. Um, so these three medications can be used to help treat alcohol use disorder. Uh, a camprosate, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, naltrexone and disulfiram. Uh, these are probably the three most common ones and they all kind of do different things in treating um, alcohol use disorder. These can help those in recovery with maintaining sobriety, right? Clients can be referred to their primary care provider to discuss these medications uh, and which might work best for them. The, the PCP can go over these different meds and this one does that and this one does this and this one you take this often and this one you take that often, but it can really help to reinforce what they're learning in treatment, right? If they're not constantly bombarded with cravings or, you know, urges to use, it can help kind of give them that space to start putting a lot of the skills that they're learning into action. So it uh, can be very helpful. All right, that was kind of the quick and dirty one, um, but does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Sarah. Um, you can go ahead and stop your share. Perfect. And then we'll come back together um, for our audience members. You can either just come off of mute to ask your questions. You can put your questions into the chat. You can use the raise hand feature, whichever you prefer. Um, but we'll kick off.
questions or thoughts from our panelists first. Is there anyone who wants to go first? I, I want to jump in. I really like, Sarah, how you um, talked about the medications, um, because the way that you, you mentioned it as a therapist is, hey, there's these meds that can help, and you can refer your patients to primary care. Um, and, and the reason I do love that is that as a physician and as an addiction medicine doc, I get a lot of resistance from, from other physicians who don't want to prescribe any of that. Um, and they say, oh, that's not, that's not my wheelhouse, or I'm not comfortable prescribing that. Um, and I think that it's, it's a good reminder that, it, that it, everyone deals with addiction and everyone needs to be comfortable managing addiction related issues within their field. And so physicians, and especially primary care docs, should be able to prescribe those medications. And in the reality, the majority of, of patients seen by a physician for alcohol use disorder are going to see their primary care. Um, so um, to add to that, what I would say is that in, you know, in, in larger places, like in Boise, we do have addiction medicine specialized physicians that patients can be referred to. Psychiatry can also manage those things, but in general, primary care should be able to, and, and we can work with primary care docs to help prescribe these medications for, for patients. I think I'll just add that, um, you know, just in general, um, medications for alcohol use disorder are, are underprescribed, um, in my opinion, and a, lot, and a lot of other people's opinions. Um, for some reason, you know, we they people just don't think of them um you know they get someone in the hospital for detox or whatever and they they just don't think about using these meds and they should um you know um so just just that general message out there you know this needs to be on your radar you need to be thinking about using these meds because they're they're really under under prescribed um i appreciated the like just the review of the like diagnostic criteria right and i think being aware that clients don't always know what falls under those. I've had a lot of people, you ask them like, oh, have you ever had withdrawals? And they immediately think of like shaking or seizures. And I'm like, well, have you ever had a hangover? And they're like, oh yeah, I get those all the time. And it's like, well, that's, that's a withdrawal too. Um, so I think it's important to just kind of look at the different ways that we can ask those questions to get the information that we need. Thanks, Amy. Um, Jake, we had a question in the chat for you. Uh, would Jake or one of the other providers review indications for each medication? I am happy to do that. So the three medications that Sarah had mentioned were um, acamprosate, naltrexone, um, and disulfiram, um, also known as antabuse. So all three of those medications are FDA approved for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. So um, there are other medications that we use that have good, some good evidence and some maybe a little bit of evidence that, that we use to treat alcohol use disorder, but those are the only ones that are FDA approved, um, which means they've gone, uh, they've undergone some extra studying to, to see if they work. Um, but it's not, it's not always the best indicator. So um, they, that would be the indications for them all. Um, acamprosate works via modulation of, of some receptors in the brain, um, the, the, the glutamate receptors in the brain and the GABA receptors. And so they help kind of modulate that to lead to sobriety and help patients stay sober. Um, if patients continue to drink on a acamprosate, they typically drink the same amount they were drinking before. Now, Trexone is an opioid blocker, um, and, which is interesting that we use that in, in um, alcohol use disorder. But what we know is that alcohol also activates the opioid receptor uh, very weakly, so not like a, a full agonist like oxycodone or morphine or fentanyl, um, but it activates that receptor a little bit and gives a little bit of euphoria. Um, and if you can block that effect with the naltrexone, then the, it helps reduce the cravings and the euphoria that comes from the alcohol. It doesn't keep them from getting drunk. It doesn't make them feel sick when they drink. It just helps keep them from getting that euphoria and that helps them reduce their drinking. So naltrexone can be effective for both um, abstinence, it helps patients stay absent, 
But in particular, it can help patients who are binge drinkers to drink a little bit less. So often patients on naltrexone, they'll drink, um, they won't even notice it, they'll keep drinking. And then they look back and they're like, oh, you know, instead of drinking six beers, I only drink three. Um, so it can be effective for that. Antabuse or disulfiram blocks alcohol, one of the metabolites of alcohol from getting out of the system. And that metabolite causes really bad reactions that make them get really sick. So antabuse is um, a medication that they cannot drink at all on or they will get sick. Most patients who are prescribed antabuse generally stop taking it um, if they want to drink, so it's not as helpful. Um, and it can be dangerous to, for patients to drink while on it. So, so that medication is reserved for very specific cases. Um, often we think, oh, it, this is like the most severe case, so we should maybe use antabuse. And it's kind of the opposite. I use the antibiotics in cases where they're actually doing pretty well and just need a little extra help to keep themselves from drinking. So by starting the, the antibiotics or disulfiram, um, they'll be able to stay um, absent. I think I'll just add that, um, you know, like trying to figure out which med to use, actually the, the best evidence is for L naltrexone. Uh, that, that's what we have the best evidence for. And then the other one, to just just to keep in mind, is is, is gabapentin because gabapentin can actually help, you know, with with some withdrawal, um, and then you can continue it um, for abstinence. So it you know kind of has two purposes there. Um, so it's good to be familiar with gabapentin, how we dose that, and how we help people with some forms of withdrawal with that. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Todd. Um, questions from any of our fellows, Brian, Tim, or Jacob. No, I thought that was a really uh, concise point. There's a couple other non-FDA approved ones like Terpiramate as well. But um, yeah, gabapentin, I'm glad that Dr. Palmer brought that up because I've seen a lot of that used in clinic. Yeah, I don't have any other comments other than uh, excellent presentation so far. Thank you. Um, Eli or Cheryl, I'll turn it over if either of you have anything. Not right now, no, actually. I don't, thank you. And any last comments? Oh, there we go. We have one from Teresa. Um, can you speak to the impact of ETOH used in geriatric patients and interventions for that population? Todd, this might be a you question here. Yeah, I mean, alcohol use in the elderly can be tricky because um, if you um, if you mix it with dementia, which is, you know, as you know, it's not uncommon in the elderly, um, they lose track of what they've drank. They, they forgot they've already, they've already drank. Because, you know, because the first thing to go in Alzheimer's, which is, you know, 60 to 80 percent of um, of dementia is Alzheimer's. And, and the first thing to go there is short term memory. Right. So they might have had a drink or two and they don't even remember it. Um, but uh, alcohol is is um, is definitely a, a, a problem in the elderly. And also um, the elderly don't they don't handle alcohol as well. Um, I mean, there, there used to be this recommendation that you know, women could have seven drinks a week that considered that was somewhat safe and men could have 14. Um, and then they'd say, you know, when the men turn 65, it's that they're the same as the women at seven. So um, you see that some places and you don't others, but uh, the bottom line is it should be seven for, for elderly men for sure. And that the elderly just, you know, it, just with all drugs and all substances, you know, they, they, they don't tolerate them as well. You know, with meds, we say go low, start low and go slow. So it's it um, even a small amount of alcohol can be it can be an issue, and then we also have the issue of falls. We have the issue of yeah. comorbid conditions, and um, you know it, it just it it really complicates things. So alcohol doesn't doesn't do it doesn't go well with aging. Um, yeah. Is there anything to think about in terms of polypharmacy adding any of these medications? Is that something that physicians think about? Well. I mean, we we always think about polypharmacy in the elderly, right? Because it's just such a common occurrence. And a lot of what I do as a geriatrician is deep prescribing. You know, we always look to deep prescribe. Um, 
so yeah, you want to look at, you know, the meds they're on because, you know, they can be on some crazy regimens and, you know, see if there's interactions. And um, so, yeah, it's really important because, you know, look, look at alcohol, pull up the meds, see what their relation, you know, what, what, what cautions and contraindications are with alcohol. That's, that's very important. Thanks for bringing that up. I just want to give a uh, additional plug for AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, that uh, it's not for everybody, but for a significant segment, it's found to be extremely helpful.